Great. I see that Courtney has joined. Hello, Courtney. Good morning. Hi, Ben. Good morning. Hopefully you can both hear me. We can. You sound crystal okay. clear. Okay, yeah. perfect. And just to confirm, I have your slides. I'll be running them today. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks. I, I'm unlike you. I don't have multiple monitors. <laughs> I would have had to set up another computer. It gets kind of clunky when I have to do it all myself. So I yeah. appreciate you. I appreciate you. Just know that. Yeah. Yeah, no, no worries at all. I'm happy to help um, have them all ready to go. We have 35 attendees. Well, hello. I see that our attendance is uh, picking up pretty good. Uh, good morning to everyone and or good afternoon if you're joining us from the East Coast or uh, mid the Midwest. Um, we'll just take another minute or so for everyone to get here and then we'll get going. Just hold tight. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I think we can get going. Um, first, just I wanted to say hello and welcome to the Puget Sound Regional Council's second peer networking event of 2021. Today, and this is, in, uh, this is a first for our peer networking program, we are excited to bring together regional planning agencies from around the country to discuss advancing equity in regional transportation planning. Uh, for today's agenda, we will have four presentations, uh, which will be followed by a moderated Q&A session. First up, we have Dr. Charles Patton, our equity manager at PSRC. He's going to provide an overview of our work to advance equity and some of our current efforts, such as the recently formed Equity Advisory Committee, um, as well as our displacement risk mapping work, and how these efforts and more are informing the update of our regional transportation plan. Second, we have Elizabeth Scott from the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Elizabeth will detail some of the goals for equity for the Chicago region and how these goals are shifting investments and priorities in transportation to prioritize low-income communities and communities of color. Third, we have Courtney Aguirre from the Southern California Association of Governments. Courtney will provide an overview and review the agency's progress in advancing equity in Connect SoCal, which is the region's long range plan down there, as well as other priorities for equity at the nation's largest metropolitan planning organization. Uh, finally, we will hear from Metro, which is the metropolitan planning organization for the Portland, Oregon region. 
A panel of Metro staff will discuss how equity is being considered and deployed at different levels of their transportation planning work. Uh, we're also very excited to have Anita Whitfield with us today. Anita is going to be moderating our Q&A session following the presentations. Um, just some uh, housekeeping and ground rules. For the Q&A, attendees uh, will be able to submit questions uh, through the Q&A button, which should be just below your video on your Zoom. And while we can't guarantee we will be able to address every question uh, that is submitted today, we really want to encourage everyone to participate and tune in as we really anticipate a great discussion among the panelists and Anita. Uh, just some final notes before I hand it off to Charles for the first presentation. Uh, if you're having any technical issues, please also use the Q&A button. Uh, you can use that to communicate with the PSRC staff and we can try to help you out. We will also be recording the panel presentations and make them along with the slides available following the event. Uh, lastly, we are offering two AICP CM credits for this event, which you may log on the American Planning Association website. That is it from me. I will pass it off to Dr. Charles Patton. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. I'm trying to share my screen. get started sorry there i think i just had to stop my share that's okay thanks man we should be good to go so good morning everyone um as ben mentioned i'm charles Patton. i'm the equity manager here at psrc it's a pleasure to be with you um today i'll be talking about the equity analysis that we conduct for our regional transportation plan but before i do that i'll share a little bit about our agency for those of you not familiar with psrc talk about some of the previous iterations of this analysis that we've created in the past to serve as the foundation for this work. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the recent strides that we've made related to racial equity that will inform our work moving forward. So PSRC is a regional planning agency based in Seattle. We're composed of over 80 urban and rural jurisdictions in King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish County, so Northwest Washington. We have a little over 4 million people in our region and we have a little over 2 million jobs. We allocate federal transportation funds based on a region-wide application process. We also develop policies and coordinate decisions about regional growth, transportation, and economic development planning using data and forecasting to inform the decisions of our member jurisdictions. We develop regional plans such as Vision 2050, which serves as our overarching long range plan provides a framework for how and where we grow. We also have the regional economic strategy that explores the ways that the region intends to sustain its economic development moving forward. And we have our regional transportation plan, which provides a blueprint for improving and coordinating mobility. The document or the policies in these documents all serve as kind of a playbook or a guide for our local jurisdictions and their comprehensive plans. The regional transportation plan maps how the region's transportation system will be sustained and improved to better connect housing with employment as well as other destinations. Essentially, it's a comprehensive document that highlights the objectives and actions we need to take for the region to meet its mobility needs. Our regional transportation plans have included an environmental justice analysis for quite some time. We've had analyses on how previous, previous plans have specifically impacted people of color as well as res residents with relatively lower incomes. They've also given us an opportunity to engage in some targeted outreach to underrepresented communities as a part of these plans as well. We recently improved on our environmental justice analysis in 2018. It's now referred to as the equity analysis report. This, this has given us an opportunity to have more information on regional trends, engage in more sophisticated use of modeling tools that will allow us to better evaluate equity and also engage in some really direct conversations and discussions about how people are specifically impacted by our policies and plans. The purpose of the equity analysis report is to evaluate both the potential benefits as well as the possible burdens of our proposed transportation policies and projects on people of color as well as residents with relatively lower incomes. Equity and increasing access to opportunity are two key outcomes used to evaluate the regional transportation plan, and they will continue to be key outcomes moving forward with this work, just so we're on the same page 
When we're referring to equitable access to transportation, this includes having choices between various transportation options, ensuring that the costs of these options are affordable, and ensuring that the travel times to destinations are reasonable for everyone in our region, regardless of their background. I wanna provide you with a few examples of what's included in the equity analysis report, just to give you a, a flavor or a taste of what's included in this work. One example is, refer, or is um, related to accessibility. PSRC has developed an index of transportation accessibility that explores how easy it is for people to reach destinations such as work, school, hospital, so forth and so on. Maybe a little difficult to see in this slide, but for those uh, living in areas where people of color serve as the majority of the population, accessibility was actually projected to improve throughout the region with noticeable gains in South King County as well as Pierce County. On its face, this seems fantastic. We're getting vulnerable residents improved access to transit, but we must keep in mind that these residents could experience an elevated risk of displacement as more and more residents move to our region and more and more residents move to these communities, driving up housing prices with that increased demand. So med mitigation measures will be required to ensure that these residents can actually remain in these communities and benefit from this increased access with the investments that we're making. Uh, continuing to track the relative accessibility between racial groups will allow us to assess how well we're doing related to this issue as we move forward. And just a note, uh, we can't currently forecast where people will live by race, which kind of limits our ability to assess future accessibility by race. Um, so we can only say that if we successfully deter displacement, communities of color will experience um, improved accessibility. However, we will continue to monitor strategies to more effectively project migration patterns by race in the future so we can more have a, a more sophisticated understanding of the racial differences in accessibility moving forward. On the topic of active transportation, as you can see in the table, investments in a regional active transportation network will provide more access to the de destination through walking and biking, especially for people of color and residents with relatively lower incomes. As you all, all are well aware, providing more opportunities to walk and bike to destinations improves one's overall health, as well as their quality of life. With that being said, it's important to recognize that for some people, walking or bicycling may be the only transportation option that they have due to the financial constraints that limit their ability to purchase a car or due to the lack of public transit options that they have in their neighborhood. For this reason, the investments we're making are important not only for their improved overall health outcomes, but for the safety of people that may not have a choice in transportation options. Um, additional research done outside of the regional transportation plan and this equity analysis has shown that the vast majority of active transportation is for walking, which may come as no surprise to the people that are attending uh, this peer networking session. And also disaggregating data shows that there's a lot of variation between communities of color related to this topic. So it will be important to continue to disaggregate this data moving forward to get a sense of where, if we're addressing the specific needs of these populations appropriately. Um, something to keep in mind, although we may improve the regional active transportation network, some people of color still may, may feel unsafe in these spaces due to their relationship and history with police which may be heightened as gentrification and racial bias make it appear as if they don't belong in spaces that they may have lived for their entire lives. Uh, or they may, may feel unsafe because they, are, they feel like they, might, they are more likely to be victims of hate crimes in these public spaces. So it will be very important to address this as we engage with communities and explore how we can implement strategies to address these safety concerns, as well as the more traditional ideas of transportation safety moving forward. Uh, last example I'll provide from the document is related to transportation costs. A low-income household would pay, as you can see, about $300 more per year on expenses like tolls, fuel, and transit fare by the time 2040 rolled around. So a household earning around $20,000 will be spending about 15% of their income solely on transportation um, in 2040. While a household earning about $60,000, which was the median income in 2014, would be spending less than half that at around 7% of their income. And obviously, as you move uh, and climb the corporate ladder or climb the economic ladder, you're spending less and less of a proportion of your income um, solely on transportation. 
When low income residents are spending this much of their income solely on transportation, particularly in high cost areas like the Puget Sound region, we are forcing these families to make extremely difficult decisions. Fill the gas tank or fill the refrigerator. Keep the lights on or keep the, high, the heat on. Uh, with this in mind, it's important to consider the role of low income discount programs like Orca Lift as well as others to ensure that that cost burden is fair across all income levels in our region. So we heard a lot of great feedback during the public outreach period. Staff collaborated with local community-based organizations to conduct outreach at places and times that were convenient for them. These conversations and outreach efforts helped build awareness about PSRC, our mission, as well as the updates that we were, make, that we were making to the regional transportation plan at the time. In addition, this outreach identified some valuable lessons learned that will inform our work moving forward. Comments really encouraged us to make some additional improvements related to public engagement, such as offering childcare and other services that can remove those barriers to engaging with us and sharing insights and participating in meetings. They also suggested that our meetings, as well as our meeting materials should be translated so that they can be more accessible um, for uh, communities that are linguistically isolated. Displacement was also a concern that was frequently brought to our attention during this public outreach period. So we made some progress related to community engagement that will help improve our outreach efforts for the upcoming regional transportation plan. The regional transportation plan survey, for those of you not familiar with it, it helps identify transportation needs so that we can more appropriately, more appropriately address them moving forward. During this current iteration of the survey, we identify community-based organizations in all four counties in the region who are working with historically marginalized communities to share the survey on our behalf. Uh, we also developed some social media toolkits that we shared with these community-based organizations. The toolkit provided them with information on the survey, the timeline for the regional transportation plan, and short messages that they can share on their respective social media platforms. Everything that we share with them was translated into a variety of different languages, as you can see, Chinese, Somali, Spanish, and Vietnamese, um, for the audience that they are more likely to engage with and for the, for the residents that they're serving. We also uh, have our equity advisory committee. We worked with an ad hoc group of people immersed in community engagement work all across our region to advise us on best practices for formalizing and standing up a committee like this. We named the ad hoc group the AHEAD group or ad hoc equity advisory design group. Group members were from all four counties. They met five times over the course of five months to develop a recommended approach that was approved by our executive board in March of this year. They, their input and expertise was extremely helpful with this process. They had some very thoughtful and innovative ideas on how to effectively engage with communities and connect communities to government to reduce disparities in our region. The AHEAD group suggested that the Equity Advisory Committee provide recommendations for various policies and projects across our agency, bringing an equity lens to those conversations. So we'll be exploring some opportunities for the committee to inform uh, work for the regional transportation plan in the future. We also have our compensation policy that addresses concerns that were raised during the public outreach period for the previous region, regional transportation plan around barriers to participation. Uh, we wanted to not only address the barriers that were raised around childcare and travel that can limit participation for marginalized groups, but we also wanted to compensate residents for the insights that they shared that will undoubtedly save us time and money by helping us avoid unintended consequences down the road. This information is vital to our agency's success and they should be paid accordingly for it. Other committee members representing local jurisdictions and agencies are essentially paid by their respective employers to attend our meetings. Equity committee members and others that are paid by their employers to attend our meetings should not be the exception to this rule. So we're currently offering a flat rate of $125 per meeting for the time spent in the meetings, the time preparing that they spend preparing for the meetings, um, childcare, as well as travel, all of that is folded into that $125. Other expenses that are not folded into that $125 that PSRC will incur include translation for participants if necessary, location rental after the pandemic is obviously over so that we can move around the region and make our meetings as accessible as possible. 
we've made some progress related to evaluating displacement uh, that will inform our work with the regional transportation plan. Obviously, this was brought up during um, the public outreach period for the last regional transportation plan. So we want to make sure that we were addressing this. So I'll share um, a few of the things that we've done related to this topic. We created the displacement risk tool to develop a better understanding of where displacement was likely to occur. Displacement risk is a composite of indicators representing five elements of displacement risk, as you can see here, socio-demographics, housing, neighborhood attributes, transportation qualities, as well as civic engagement. Areas are categorized as higher, moderate, or lower, with higher risk representing the top 10% of scores among all tracks using uh, these uh, indices or using this index. We also added a question to the 2019 household travel survey exploring why people decided to move from their previous homes. We mapped the prior home location of all the recent movers that were surveyed and then overlay this with the displacement risk map that I just showed you on those previous two slides. The movers were then categorized into three areas or three categories of displacement risk, higher, moderate, and lower. And we found that one third of the surveyed movers that were living in those high risk areas reported at least one displacement factor leading to their move. So they said that they were either experiencing high housing costs, which pushed them out. There was a reduction in their income that forced them to move or elements of their community were leaving such as neighborhoods or community institutions that forced them to move. So the survey data really helped validate the displacement risk mapping tool. And it further reiterated that we need to be thoughtful about mitigation strategies that we're putting in place to ensure that these households can enjoy the transportation investments that we're planning to make in their communities. I'll touch briefly on some, some next steps and then we can move on to the next panelists. Uh, we will be refreshing all of our current analyses. Uh, we'll be uh, leveraging the aforementioned resources that I just shared with you when applicable for the regional transportation plan. We'll also continue to be as innovative as we possibly can be, continue to seek some um, improvements that we can make to the regional transportation plan. And last but not least, we'll be learning from you all today um, from all of the, the audience members that share their thoughts on our plan, as well as the panelists and the innovative ideas that they're incorporating in their work. So with that, I can take any questions that you might have. Fantastic. Thank you, Charles. Um, yeah, so I don't see any questions coming through the Q&A button yet. Oh, there is just one, one question for Charles. Um, I will um, use the answer live feature so Charles can um, answer it. You mentioned the equity toolkit looks back at existing and earlier plans. Could you speak about the process and limits of that? The equity toolkit. Say that one more time. Uh, you mentioned the equity toolkit looks back at existing and earlier plans. Uh, could you speak about that process and limits of that? Oh, I don't remember saying that. Um, the equity toolkit that, that we have in our, our regional equity strategy is a little different from uh, what I mentioned during this presentation, but um, the equity toolkit that we have is exploring the different um, uh, strategies that we can use to reduce, reduce disparities. The, the structural racism that has informed the current disparities that we have and how we can kind of dismantle some of the policies that we currently have that are perpetuating those disparities. So that's something that is um, that we're currently working on with the regional equity strategy. So um, I can speak to that, but I don't know about the other parts. So sorry about that. No worries. I think also this might be a good topic for our, our moderated Q&A session. I'm sure our other panelists would have some um, interesting thoughts on a similar thread. Um, I think we just have time for one more before we move on to the next panel. Um, there's one from Shirley Lee. Uh, thank you, Charles. I want to ask who are the members of the equity advisory group? Could you elaborate the flat rate more? Um, is it the compensation for each public meeting um, or is it for a total? So the $125 is for each meeting. So the, the, the flat rate captures um, the time that they spend at that meeting, the time they spend preparing for that meeting as well as child care and travel. Um, and so that's going to, we'll probably have like monthly meetings for the equity advisory committee. We're currently looking for members of the equity advisory committee. So we have our website that was just recently posted yesterday that includes an application, a call for application, as well as other materials, a frequently asked questions document. So we'll probably be standing that committee up in October. Great, thank you. 
see that there's a few more questions coming in. Um, if I can ask that we hold off on those until the moderated Q&A session later so we can move on to our next panelist, which is Elizabeth Scott from CMAP, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. And I am pulling up your slides right now. Thanks, Ben, um, and good morning, everyone. As Ben mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Scott. I'm a principal in the policy group at CMAP, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. And I was delighted to be invited to participate in this conversation about equity and regional transportation planning and to offer some insight uh, into what we've been up to at CMAP. I'm also really um, excited and looking forward to the discussion with these other MPOs. So for my talk, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context on CMAP and our regional plan. And then I'm gonna highlight four examples of ways that we have integrated equity uh, into our planning work through the implementation of the 2050 plan. So uh, over the last three years. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Next slide, please, Ben. So CMAP uh, is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Northeastern Illinois Chicago Metro Region. So for my, my West Coast people, we're east of the Mississippi River and on the Western uh, shore of Lake Michigan and still, at least for a few months, the third largest city in the country at the center of our region. Uh, we'll have to see what the census says. Um, we were formed in 2005. Uh, by merging two organizations, a regional transportation organization, and regional land use organization. So we have an integrated charge. We serve a seven county region, uh, almost 300 municipalities and over 1500 units of government uh, and almost 9 million residents, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, next slide, please. In 2018, we adopted onto 2050, the region's uh, comprehensive plan. This would be more equivalent to the vision plan at PSRC. Uh, it has three principles. Next slide. And this is just to give you a very high level taste of, of kind of what we, our thoughts have been. The first principle is that of resilience. The idea that we have to devote ourselves to preparing for uh, shocks, acute shocks, which this last year has really uh, proven out. And that, um, you know, resilience, resilience to future shocks, man-made, natural, anticipated, not anticipated is important for all kinds of systems that serve the region. Next slide. We're also focused on prioritized investment, uh, which I think will probably resonate with everyone here, that we have limited resources to do all the things that we need to do. And so that requires the highest possible level of care, transparency, and accountability around the use of all of the resources that we have. Next slide. And then our third principle for the ONTU 2050 plan is the idea of inclusive growth, which is um, an equity related concept that basically says uh, all places that are more equitable do better for everyone over the long term. So it's, it's the idea that if everyone has the ability to contribute to and benefit from your economy, you'll have more aggregate growth and more aggregate prosperity. It combats the idea that um, reducing inequity or becoming more equitable is a zero sum game. And so that's why we chose this framing for the regional plan. Um, if it's a framing you're interested in, I recommend that you take a look at the Angela Glover Blackwell piece, Equity is the Superior Growth Model. That'll give you more information and we can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested at all. Um, next slide. But one of the practical ways for the regional plan that we implemented the in inclusive growth principle across all of the dimensions of our plan is by doing some data work uh, through which we identified what we ended up calling economically disconnected and disinvested areas in the region so you'll see on the map here, we have a couple of different types of areas. One, the yellow is our region's um, basically low-income communities of color identified by household income, uh, greater than regional average share of people of color or households with uh, limited English proficiency. 
Our stakeholders also shared with us that we needed to think about commercial real estate. So we layered on top of that uh, census tracts in the region that had the greatest job loss, lowest commercial real estate values and low rates of small loans to business. And this map doesn't give us a lot by itself, but when we use it to overlay other things like our flooding maps, our investment maps, our transit access maps, our job location maps, that starts to give you an idea and a context and a lens through which to discuss disparities. And we've done a number of things with it. Um, next slide. So with that context, um, I wanted to talk about four things that we've been working on. One, a community cohort tool, some uh, ideas around the investments that we can make of federal funds, a report, and then an engagement program. Next slide. So using the economically disconnected areas analysis along with a number of other things, um, we created a measure of local capacity, local municipal capacity. So share of households in the economically disconnected areas, tax base per capita, median household income and population to come to this map of, uh, you know, of different differing levels of capacity within our region. And so we've been able to use that to target our own technical assistance and our own um, kind of incentives that we can provide to lower capacity or higher need communities. And then more recently, we worked with our big county, um, uh, Cook County, to use this model to allocate $51 million of CARES Act, come, uh, CARES Act funds coming to the region. Next slide, please. And then with respect to federal transportation programming, um, CMAP, like the other entities on the call, you know, as a metropolitan planning organization, has responsibility to work with our local governments to program uh, three federal fund sources, the surface transportation program, congestion mitigation and air quality program, and transportation alternatives program. We program generally about $300 million every two years. Next slide. So one of the innovative things that we did through the ONTU 2050 um, plan development process was work with our local partners to enable the use of what's called transportation development credits for highways, or sometimes they're called toll credits, um, to create a situation where these credits could stand in for local match in our communities with highest needs. So effectively, uh, communities would have access to 100% um, you know, federal funded or funded on their behalf uh, resources for transportation projects. It's also paired with some um, pre-development assistance and engineering uh, support. And we can use these in um, all of our funding sources. Next slide. We also worked with our local partners to develop a surface transportation program regional shared fund. So this is, um, about $40 million a year that comes into a regional fund where the um, projects are selected using performance-based methods and under the recommendation of a committee that represents our regional councils of government and the city of Chicago. And the purpose of this is to be innovative, flexible, and better help um, implement our regional plan. Next slide. And so, uh, you know, now that we have this fund, which we've had one full call for projects on, and then we just opened another one in January, uh, we have about $200 million over five years that we program based on uh, performance measures that include readiness, transportation impact, and a variety of planning factors. And this is where equity really comes in, is that we, um, one of the measurements that we do is ask how many low-income uh, people of color would benefit from the use of this facility. So it's more complicated than just, is this community a community of high need, concentrated area of poverty or so forth? Because we know people move all around and a project somewhere else, you know, particularly transit projects might be beneficial to people who are transit dependent, for instance. Next slide. So 25% of the total score for this $200 million is uh, in the 30, uh, 30 point area. 
and uh, our inclusive growth points. So the equity equity criteria is the strongest uh, strongest scorer in in this scoring aspect for the performance based programming of these funds. It puts the thumb on the scale pretty strongly for projects that benefit low income uh, communities of color and users of color. Next slide. And so after our first call for projects, I can report that um, we had uh, the impacts where we ended up sending or programming $31 million for communities in the highest need. So our category four communities, uh, four of 17 projects were in very small communities that might not otherwise have had the capacity to uh, compete for some of these resources. And 25% of the users will be low-income people of color uh, in, of the investments coming out of this STP shared fund. Next slide. Uh, we also have just released this month a, a report that we worked on for two years assessing the equity of various transportation fees, fines, and fares. And the reason that we did this is that, you know, and I think probably the other panelists will relate to this too, is that as a MPO, we have to figure out how to fully fund the region's transportation system, but we also need the transportation system to work for people, particularly the people who are most vulnerable and, and need the support in transportation the most. So how do we balance these uh, revenue goals with our equity goals? Uh, that it was the purpose of getting into this paper to assess the progressivity or regressivity of all kinds of different fees, fines, and fares. Next slide. And so we had a multidisciplinary team that assessed uh, the impacts of different fees, fines, and fares. We recommended some uh, tangible changes to our partners, like our transit partners, our tollway partner, and a variety of other entities, our state secretary of state. And this work was supported by a group of nonprofit, civic and advocacy uh, people who really let us know where we could stretch ourselves a little bit further and, and where we were meeting the mark. Next slide. So this paper came out, as I said earlier this month and it has a variety um, of recommendations and I will share the paper link in the chat in a minute and not get into it too much, but there are things like fine reform and figuring out ways for uh, low-income people to save money through the use of like uh, electronic toll passes and different kinds of fair integration strategies. Uh, and, and so we would love it if you would look at that and share if you have any thoughts. Next slide. <clears throat> Finally, something we're really, really excited about is that we've just brought on a consultant to help us stand up something that we're calling now the Equitable Engagement Program. The purpose of this work is to advance equity and environmental justice in regional planning in our, in our region. Um, we've done a great job, you know, kind of as Charles was mentioning earlier, having our civic partners at the table with us, people who are paid to be there, but we haven't done such a great job um, having other people at the table with us, even though we know that input and engagement from you know, people who are affected by our decisions is critical. So the purpose of this project is to enhance our existing outreach and engagement efforts and to really lean into the fact that uh, you know, government has had a large role in uh, producing inequality, both in the past and in the present day, because if we don't oppose systems of inclusion, they have a way of, uh, or excuse me, oppose systems of exclusion, they have a way of uh, repeating themselves. Next slide. So what are we doing? We put out an RFP, we hired a Chicago based nonprofit team, and they are going to be with us for the next eight to 10 months, working to co design a program, whereby we can provide stipends to primarily nonprofit professionals who are representative of the region's diversity, and we're going to set up a program that provides, provides stipends over the long term and engages this group of folks in a sustained way so that, um, you know, we can better get their input. Uh, people can have greater impact on the regional transportation planning process, um, and that there can be some 
capacity building for all of us around how we bring the change that communities need and communities are looking for. And um, we're funding this program at $500,000, including $250,000 for stipends in this first trial period. And to make sure that we're being holding ourselves accountable and being as transparent as possible, we've also hired the UIC University of Illinois at Chicago Urban Transportation Center to do an independent evaluation after we try it for three years to let us know where we're hitting the mark and where we still need to improve. And I'm incredibly, incredibly excited about this um, work among many of the other things that we're doing. So uh, with that, next slide. If anybody has any questions about any of these efforts, you're more than welcome. And I encourage you to reach out to me and I can uh, share information or happy to have a discussion on any of these things. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of our work today. I am done. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, that was really, really informative and great. Um, I just see a couple uh, kind of specific questions that I think we have some time for you to answer, if that's okay. Um, the first one is, and I will hit the answer live button, is can you expand on how the TDCH credits are allocated for high need areas? It seems like the community cohorts are on a smaller geography, but the funding must, must just go to the jurisdiction. Do you have to commit to using the funds in those category four areas? So, so how we, yeah, if you go, if you go back to the community cohort slide, those are actually munis municipal boundaries, this, this one. So we, um, if you're a dark blue municipality, you can get the toll credits. And that is a synthetic measure of capacity based on these four criteria. And it's, yeah, it's not census tract based, it's uh, munis municipal based, the project, project sponsor based. We have many tiny municipalities. Sounds familiar. Um, and then, so one more is, is this similar to the Title VI equity analysis? And I'm not sure if that was yes. in reference to anything specific. Yeah, okay. it's definitely related to uh, Title VI equity analysis. And, and for our equitable engagement program, especially we're leaning into the Title VI responsibility um, to use federal funds to provide stipends for this program. Great. And so for people who don't know, the um, 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, really talks about um, government's responsibility around benefits and burdens. And, you know, we can discuss as a group, there's always room to improve there, but it is, it is a requirement uh, of, of MPOs and other entities that's something that you can use um, to justify, validate, elevate, um, some of the efforts that you want to make around these topics. And so just there's a couple questions uh, referring to um, the fines that are being reformed and, and some recommendations around that, although maybe that could be a good topic for the moderated Q&A as well. Um, I don't know if you have any kind of initial thoughts. Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll put the paper in the chat. I kind of blew through it because I was like, oh, no, got to keep on time here. Um, but uh, we, we've talked about, for instance, um, ability to pay waivers. We've talked about income-based fine reform. Um, uh, it's related to uh, other work that we're doing on safety, where we're really looking into uh, what's being called self-enforcing streets that would uh, minimize the need for officer-based enforcement um, of, of fines. But yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of, I think, room for improvement in this space. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think in the interest of time, we will move on to, uh, Courtney Aguirre from SCAG. I see that there's a couple other questions in there. If I can just ask again that we hold off because they're really good questions. I want uh, the rest of the panel to have a chance to address them. So, um, I see that people are using the Q&A. I want people to continue doing that, but if your question doesn't get answered immediately, just know that it's probably because I want everyone to have an input on it. Um, so with that being said, 
We will now transition to Courtney Aguirre from SCAG, and I will pull up your slides as well. Just give me one moment. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. Um, as Ben said, my name is Courtney, and I'm a program manager for public health and safety at the Southern California Association of Governments. I am also a co-lead for SCAG's equity group, work group, which is an internal interdisciplinary uh, group of staff. Um, and today I'll be sharing some highlights from our past efforts to integrate equity into our regional transportation plan and sustainable community strategy, or um, the shorthand uh, Connect SoCal. Um, I'll also be highlighting some of our current efforts to build a foundation for the integration of equity into our next long range plan that would be adopted in 2024. So we're coming right off of an adoption year right now. Um, next, side, next slide, please. Uh, but first, I'd like to just give you that bit of context that the others have been sharing with you too. Uh, the region that I plan for is vast. It covers 38,000 square miles, six counties, 191 cities. Um, it borders Nevada, Arizona, Mexico, and it's home to nearly 19 million residents or roughly half of California's population. Next slide, please. Uh, so our long range plan, as I mentioned, was adopted this past year in a bifurcated process. The pandemic uh, kind of threw a wrench in our April adoption plans. Um, so the first portion was adopted in May, the second portion in September, and the goals of included in the plan are centered around improving the economy, mobility, the environment, and communities within our region. Um, but among the plan's eight overarching goals, uh, one is explicit with regards to equity, stating that the plan is meant to support uh, healthy and, com and equitable communities. Um, the plan includes uh, really literally thousands of projects as well as strategies that can be implemented to help meet these goals. Um, and it was created through collaboration with local jurisdictions transportation agencies, and stakeholders from throughout our region. Next slide, please. Now, with regard to collaboration in developing the plan um, and procedural equity, uh, SCAG partnered with 18 community-based organizations, or CBOs, to help increase the diversity of perspectives that were included in the plan's development. We solicited partners that were pr primarily serving populations of communities identified in our public participation plan as underrepresented. So your low income families and communities of color, people with disabilities and individuals for whom English is uh, not their primary language. Um, CBO tasks included convening meetings, tabling at local events and pop-ups and collecting survey input um, on the plan. And these partners also helped to promote the public workshops as well as convey uh, their own stakeholders input to us um, for focused discussions on the issues and strategies included in our plan. We compensated these partners, of course, with a flat rate of $100 per hour based on our market research of salaries and operating costs. Um, this was to avoid a complicated and lengthy accounting process um, for invoicing. We also reimbursed costs for meeting materials, translation, as well as light refreshments. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of uh, the plan's equity analysis, um, so that can primarily be found within our public health and environmental justice components, uh, similar to others with at least the EJ components. Um, our public health analysis details our current health outcomes and trends in the region, and it identifies the health outcomes that we anticipate with uh, that we anticipate through implementation of the plan. Um, the public health analysis also incorporates um, three public health frameworks, which we regard as quite critical, the social determinants of health, health in all policies, and a health equity framework to further assess those health outcomes, disparities, and impacts in our disadvantaged communities. Um, and health equity really is woven among each of the focus areas that are highlighted on the slide before you. Uh, next slide, please. So our plan contains a substantial environmental justice analysis. Um, it's a bit of a behemoth at a, clocking in at about a couple hundred pages. Um, while we are required like other MPOs to do this EJ analysis for um, what the federal government refers to as minority and low income communities, we also conduct analysis of other vulnerable groups, including non-English speakers, households without vehicles, people without a high school degree or equivalent, people with disabilities, seniors, as well as young children, those ages four and under. Um, 
and our EJ analysis is conducted at the regional, local, and the community levels. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of our community-based approach, we identify areas throughout the region that have a high concentration of EJ groups or have a de demonstrably higher, ri higher risks to exposure. Um, that would be the disadvantaged uh, areas that you'll see. And that's really a statewide definition for California um, and a statewide index that many, many um, grant applications, um, not grant applications, but grant programs rely on for scoring purposes. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, and within our own EJ analysis, we um, include 18 performance indicators to make the report a little bit more user-friendly and applicable. The indicators are categorized under those four overarching EJ-focused questions you see before you. How will this impact quality of life? How will this impact health and safety? How will this impact transportation costs? And then finally, how will this impact the commute? Um, next slide, please. Um, and so, the EJ technical report, um, just to wrap this up for you on the EJ component, um, it includes general plan element icons, those little bubbles um, on the left-hand side of the, of the screen. That's to assist our local jurisdictions in fulfilling their Senate Bill 1000 requirements. The icons are placed next to each indicator included within the report. Um, for those of you not from California, uh, SB 1000 requires that our local jurisdictions uh, with disadvantaged communities, that statewide definition, develop an EJ element or consider EJ goals, policies, and objectives in their general plans. Um, and finally, in terms of our long range plan, um, the other components addressing equity, uh, we have an EJ toolbox within the plan too, which provides some recommended practices and approaches to addressing those existing and potential inequitable outcomes um, for EJ communities that are organized and they're organized by performance measures. Um, it's really intended to function as a solid resource for again, the local jurisdictions to consult as they're developing their approaches for addressing um, and mitigating uh, impacts to uh, these communities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so beyond the plan itself, we've adapted and expanded our implementation strategy, uh, which includes our plans and programs highlighted on the slide before you. Um, I have a handful of, of examples I'd like to share, focusing on how we're advancing equity through um, a few a few of our programs um, just in the past uh, several months. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, for example, um, SCAG's mini grantee program, mini grants program, uh, funds community driven safety projects that meet the needs of people most harmed by traffic injuries and fatalities. The program supports organizations that are invested in safety and mobility justice, but might not have had transportation as their core focus. So these um, include groups such as those focusing on public health, disability justice, social services, parent groups, tribal nations, um, so forth. And we've been doing this program now since about um, 2018. And so um, it's, it's been a fantastic way to uh, get some, um, some slices of, uh, smaller slices of awards out to CBOs in a quick way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this past year, we released a call for collaboration and partnership with a foundation. The intent of the program um, is to seed and uplift community-driven approaches and strategic coalitions that address uh, the challenges, the very significant challenges in meeting housing needs while addressing historic racial in inequities. So we awarded more than a million dollars in funding um, this past year to community groups to do this work. Um, many of their projects cover, uh, you know, they cover a real range of activities related to housing and policy and land use, um, including, of course, that deeper commitment to uh, community engagement with low income and uh, communities of color. Uh, next slide, please. And to wrap up um, on implementation examples, uh, we have a longstanding uh, sustainable communities program that provides direct technical assistance grants to our local jurisdictions to um, complete planning and policy um, efforts. Uh, again, all with intention of implementing our long range plan. Um, through our past calls for projects, we, we have prioritized and we continue to prioritize funding in disadvantaged communities through our scoring methodologies. And this final call that we're doing this, this year um, is going to be exclusively focused on EJ communities. Um, and so we're planning to develop those guidelines in partnership with stakeholders so that they can really align with what local needs are 
Um, and we expect that what we may fund uh, could again be pretty broad. It could focus on say, um, bridging the digital divide issues that we have. Um, it could be focusing more on health and equity, which are extremely critical right now, um, or it could be our traditional um, focus on land use and uh, transportation, um, which also intersects with these other issues, of course. Um, so next slide, please. So last summer when we were in the throes of finalizing our long range plan and identifying those steps to move forward with implementation, our regional council, along with a lot of other governing boards, um, adopted a resolution affirming its commitment to meaningfully advance equity across our region. So we kicked off work with a special committee on equity and social justice, which was really focused this past year on developing our agency's response um, to advancing equity through our agency's activities, including our long range plan, Connect SoCal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so going forward, um, our work is meant to be grounded in this definition that the special committee helped shape. Um, we're with it has the focus on leading with racial equity so that we can address those longstanding inequities within, um, within our region that are disproportionately experienced by people of color. Uh, next slide, please. So our work is um, also going to be grounded in our understanding of our regional conditions. So I've shared with you a bit about our EJ analysis. So we've, we've done uh, quite a bit of work um, on understanding what these existing conditions are, um, but we have more we realize we can do. So um, in the past year, in the past several months, we completed an assessment of our baseline conditions. This is what we call a preliminary assessment because there's a lot of community consultation that needs to be done to discuss the indicators that we're including and um, how meaningful they are, as well as um, you know the qualitative experience of our communities in relation to them. Um, and so we have developed this baseline analysis with additional indicators. It's, I think, uh, a far more racially and ethnically stratified analysis than we've done in the past, breaking it down a, quite, quite a bit more. Um, and so it's something, again, that we hope to expand upon um, in our next plan. Um, and going forward, we're hoping we can consult it as we um, develop those performance measures and targets. Uh, next slide, please. So just really quickly, here's a list of indicators that we considered in our baseline conditions analysis. Many, many, they do overlap with our EJ indicators, uh, though not all. And um, this is, you know, a list that we anticipate uh, could very well expand. Uh, we had, I think, originally about 70 different indicators we were exploring, but had some challenges with um, acquiring uh, the stratified data at the levels that we needed. Um, next slide, please. So based on an understanding of these existing conditions and feedback from stakeholders, the special committee, uh, what we did is we developed this racial equity early action plan that is actually going for adoption by a regional council next Thursday. It's going to be a very big day for us. It includes a total of 29 different actions that are split across multiple goals and strategies. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, this early action plan includes several actions relating and tying back to our long range plan, which is really the bread and butter of what we do at SCAG. Um, so to integrate equity more fully into our next iteration of the plan, we've included included more funding in next year's budget to conduct um, equity focused outreach to help shape the plan. And again, improve our understanding of those existing inequities in our communities and um, what the current efforts are to address them. Um, this engagement is, is really going to kick off um, our process of and our efforts to define our equity goals, um, policies, as well as metrics, and consider uh, refinements to our EJ analysis, for example, um, including additional disadvantage factors and doing additional stratification um, and analysis of the data. Um, so we're also evaluating how we can do a better job of evaluating our transportation projects, right, that are included in the plan and more immediately in our 2023 FTIP. So our new FTIP system that we um, just, uh, we just um, in the past year or so uh, developed is actually capable now of supporting this additional sort of project level analysis um, so that we can identify where we have um, where, where these projects are distributed in a mapping uh, tool. Um, so their relationship to our communities of concern, our disadvantaged communities and so on. 
Um, and finally, we are working to assess how we can refine our equity goals and evaluation criteria used in our funding programs, such as that sustainable communities program that I was referencing earlier. Um, we do prioritize um, work in uh, high need communities, as I mentioned, and currently we're depending on, you know, a variety of different indexes, um, our health, California's Healthy Places Index, um, California's Disadvantaged Communities Index, um, and also, of course, our own, our own um, our own defined uh, community areas, the communities of concern I referenced earlier and environmental justice areas. So there are a lot to consider, um, <laughs> a lot of different um, indexes, but um, we're trying to figure out what, what could work best for our region. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the work we do um, or we need to do is quite frankly, really foundational to start, I think, uh, we need to better define equity in relation to many of our programs. I mentioned how we have a health equity definition. We do, um, a, we have a lot of discussion about environmental justice, but um, we, we don't yet have that for some of our other programs like housing equity, climate equity, for example. Um, and our sustainability team has already started working on uh, development of a definition of environmental equity. And so I think, I think those definitions will certainly be a way for us to engage with our stakeholders more in discussing equity and how it relates and ties back to our different programs, um, but also it's laying that foundation right um, for, for other discussions and for the work itself. Um, so we'll need to consider also our metrics as well as the strategies and actions uh, that will help us and support us in achieving, um, you know, community supported uh, targets. Um, so I would, okay, um, <laughs> I guess I'll go on one more slide uh, if you can advance one more slide. Uh, this will round things out. Um, I just wanted to conclude um, with this slide, which does illustrate some of the additional disadvantage factors we may consider integrating in that EJ analysis. Um, but again, that's going to tie back to, you know, all this outreach that we're going to be doing in the next year. Um, we have a UCLA grad student who's been doing some research for us this past year and evaluating the different EJ approaches of MPOs. Uh, whether they use those binary thresholds or bin scoring uh, to develop an index. Uh, the big MPOs in California have been using binary thresholds, but we're considering right now exploring whether, um, again, an, an individual index for SCAG uh, might be helpful. Um, and with that, I, I guess I finally conclude with, uh, I, I know that this work um, for us has felt at times quite daunting um, but of course, it's very necessary, and we're, we're quite grateful for panels like this, where we can learn about the work of others and find ways to, you know, support one another as we go forward, since, since we're all trying to, you know, uh, move forward together. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, that was fantastic, and I totally agree. These, these kinds of events and in, in, uh, peer exchanges should help us get closer to what needs to be done and the answers. Um, so I do not see any newer questions coming through the chat. So I think with that, let, let's just go right into our last panel presentation. Um, and we have a few folks from Metro, not to be confused with King County Metro for us Puget Sound folks. This is Metro in Portland which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, works in the three county region down there. So I will just turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, hi, hello everybody. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak about um, our, our efforts to kind of evolve our approach to uh, equity and in our planning and investment decisions. My name is Jeff Raker. I'm the Senior Economic Development Planner at Metro. Uh, Oregon Metro is a three county um, MPO uh, with some other functions as well. Um, and I just wanted to start uh, by giving you an overview of um, the changing approaches and, and sort of the, the shift we've gone through as an agency, uh, as well as leading into some project level experience that I've had. And I'll turn it over to colleagues um, that have had some other experiences that I think will be informative for this group. I'm looking forward to diving in on all the different um, uh, uh, approaches that folks are empl employing um, in other regions. And it's great to see some good examples. So the folks you see up in front of you, hopefully, I, is my screen active for everybody? The folks, hello? I can see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> My boss. Okay, um, so the the folks in uh, on the screen are a tremendous group of people that um, were part of an adult and youth cohort um, made up of uh, people of color with 
speaking various languages that have been provided uh, stipends and other forms of support, childcare, et cetera, to be uh, as part of a leadership training exercise, as well as being able to inform uh, our efforts on equitable development in connection to a light rail project. And it's, it's these um, relationships we have with community-based organizations that can engage folks uh, more directly um, that have been extremely informative for all of our agency activities. Um, so the region itself is 1.6 million. It's a three county region with 24 cities. 27% um, of our population are people of color. Um, and we have like these other, the other regions that have um, presented clearly um, historic and current disparities that have um, been significant impact on both our transportation and land use um, uh, considerations in recent years, um, particularly the loss of people of color in North and Northeast Portland um, yeah, and sort of a, a transition to exurban suburban areas and the impacts that that has had, particularly in East Portland has been uh, of conversation. And then we are evaluating very much what our role is in you know, reflecting that history and reflecting the um, influence of land use and transportation investment and trying to get a handle on um, sort of the conditions that folks are experiencing and can and will be experiencing as investments are made. Um, so part of this journey, it's, it's a long journey. It started in 2010 where our council at the time adopted six desired outcomes for the agency, one of which focuses on equity. Um, that led into sort of the initiation of an equity strategy program, uh, various inventories and, and committee um, engagement that then you know, fed into what I, I think has been highly informative for our agency in 2016, the strategic plan for racial equity and formation of a diversity, equity and inclusion program. And that's informed both internal um, activities when it comes to hiring uh, a look at contracting both uh, internally as long as well as with other public agencies. Um, and then there's um, a significant influence that that has had in both our transportation planning and uh, for the regional transportation plan project level experiences and other um, sort of department level activities. Um, this in turn informed various um, uh, investments we make, the get moving measure, which Sabrina will speak to in a moment, uh, as well as um, feeding some external work that I've been working on, uh, the economic recovery plan, uh, which is a connection to a partner organization that works on economic development um, issues and, and uh, has been extremely good about shifting the conversation from traditional economic development to more of an inclusive economic development um, uh, sort of emphasis and, and set of actions. Um, so this is the six desired outcomes um, focused on equity and our overall tagline at the time was making a great place and these connected to all of this. And then this is the strategic plan for racial equity and the transportation plan um, and its uh, principles for equity and analysis that were folded in and, and continue to be guiding us. Um, so the transportation plan itself has a set of investment priorities and these investment priorities um, were informed through the types of engagement that I gave on the, on the first slide where we've relied on community-based organizations to be more trusted um, uh, partners with the community and bringing up the, and elevating the uh, ideas and concepts and uh, sort of concerns and considerations that uh, resident leaders and others that are advocates in their own community um, are presenting uh, on a variety of topics. And then specifically, uh, the set of equity policies and strategies, the way we approached the equity analysis and um, definition around uh, the equity focus areas that we'll go to in a moment. So the four um, key equity policies were prioritizing reducing disparities and, and barriers, particularly for people of color and people with low income, and evaluating transportation investments for equity benefits and impacts, engaging in addressing the needs of marginalized communities in um, our planning and our implementation and anticipating and minimizing displacement impacts. And I, I think this is a good echo of the strategic plan for racial equity, as well as um, informing a lot of the project level activities, both on transportation and land use. Um, so the equity focus areas I referenced, I, I'm not necessarily the correct staff to go into depth on this and, and Joe Gordon will uh, later on in terms of our approach and methods. 
But the idea is let's find those areas with overlapping um, considerations um, for you know, disparity and potential uh, impacts um, uh, when it comes to um, equity considerations. And so our focus was on those areas that are experiencing high levels of um, uh, challenges when it comes to safety, jobs access, and public health affordability and involuntary displacement. And there's a specific emphasis on those with limited English um, proficiency, uh, you know, sort of an income uh, threshold look as well as um, people of color. Um, safety clearly is an equity issue. 60% uh, of our projects uh, in the RTP were found to improve safety and three quarters of those projects are were found to be located in those equity focus areas, um, but there is a significant gap in terms of um, overall projects investment that has historically happened between communities. And so we're, we're definitely trying to um, integrate that into both our planning and our investment decision making. Um, my experience on a project level with the Southwest Corridor Equitable Development Strategy. So there was a light rail project. There is a light rail project that's uh, planned from our downtown into some of the suburbs to the Southwest. Um, and we engaged the CBOs and a variety of others in um, setting uh, equitable development principles um, based on some of the same types of engagement that I described where we're relying on our CDO partners and, and working closely with them to um, sort of engage on issues of displacement, on um, business and workforce stabilization, in addition to kind of resident affordable housing stabilization and other types of mechanisms to ensure more equitable development outcomes when we make a major public investment. And so these are the set of um, principles that were established as part of that um, initial group. Um, so expanding the breadth and depth of influence among affected people, uh, addressing residential and business displacement, reducing disparities, um, you see affordable housing, economic opportunity in the form of business and workforce um, stability and supports, and uh, promoting transportation mobility and connectivity, um, and uh, sort of a focus on health and safety, similar to much of what the other uh, NPOs have described. Um, one thing that I think is different about this approach that we employed in the Southwest Corridor, however, um, is we took a federal grant led process that was, um, you know, largely determining uh, the, these principles metro led and took that project level activity when it comes to defining equitable development priorities and actions, um, we did some test applications, et cetera, and worked very closely with um, external partners in housing advocacy, in more general community advocacy, as well as those working on economic and workforce issues. Um, but Metro was still at the center. Uh, the intention though, uh, going forward, and, and it has been activated now, is to move from this kind of government, federal grant, uh, agency-led activity to one that has, embraces more of a coalition-based um, uh, emphasis with CBO leaders and sort of in a collective impact model um, where they are at the center of circle and we're outer circle and we're pro providing expertise and, in, and, and uh, certainly um, informing um, decisions as much uh, as we can uh, from our perspective, um, but we are no longer at the center. Um, so the transition has been to take this sort of government funded effort and have it be supported by outside government sources. Um, so Meyer Memorial Trust is a philanthropic organization that stepped in as well as others that are now supporting the advance of the Southwest Equity Coalition led by a set of two, uh, currently two um, community-based organizations that are centered on um, uh, you know, advocating and advancing racial equity. Um, so that's been a major shift that's had influence on how we approach sort of our project level activities um, and, and uh, inform some of the regional activities as well. And then I just wanted to bring up some of the analytical tools that we, we utilized. Um, so this is the economic value atlas. We established this in combination with the Brookings Institution, a number of local partners. And the idea was to get a sense of what are the economic conditions on the landscape in our region and uh, focusing in on business or traditional economic development, uh, uh, you know, th things of importance and then a more inclusive economic development objective and place. 
and getting a sense of um, sort of the, the particular conditions and developability and affordability in particular areas. Um, that has since been now adapted as a platform for use in the Southwest Corridor, finding proxies for those equitable development principles, and then being able to map things like community change, where you look at you know, where are there rising incomes, lowering incomes, um, where are there transitions in the percentage of people of color, what's happening to sales prices, et cetera, to get you a sense of kind of the gentrification, the activity of gentrification um, that might be happening alongside other um, issues um, that we outlined here. So housing affordability, health and safety, access to opportunity, mobility and connectivity. So these analytical tools are very informative, um, but we wanted to be sure that it's not the end of the story. And um, we are working hard to um, find the qualitative and sort of interpretive um, uh, efforts that, that will help us really get a better understanding of what conditions are for particular households. Um, one aspect, the University of Washington developed the self-sufficiency standard. There's a workforce development organization locally that started to apply this to our local counties and communities to find out, okay, if you have two adults, um, one infant and one preschooler, and you have this particular family type, what is your ability to uh, be self-sufficient in, in terms of housing, childcare, food, healthcare, transport, and uh, other costs that are affiliated with households? And that informed more of a portrait of uh, different types of households and their experience in the corridor itself to get a sense of what uh, households we might be um, either supporting or impacting um, as we make the investments. And this is obviously an evolving approach, but it goes beyond just the um, sort of the purely analytical to dive in where the data might be lacking or where um, uh, other you know, information might be lacking that we need to understand and allows for a conversation with the community about how to interpret this information more effectively. Um, so overall on a project level, um, this is kind of where we uh, have landed on in terms of my personal roadmap as well as others I think that are operating in this space um, where we set equity principles based on best practices among peers but make sure that those are grounded in um, meaningful engagement and both those principles and the data we utilize is uh, grounded in the types of engagement that many of the MPOs have described here and, and we employ similar uh, activities. Um, ensure that there's testimonials and qualitative information that's presented alongside the data um, and then connecting actions to equity outcomes. So one thing we've done is, is really tested out applications. So for instance, working with one of the area hospitals to um, ensure that folks in the corridor that work in a um, food service or maintenance at the uh, hospital are given the, the um, ability to uh, seek job training that then will put them on a medical career track at that, that major employer. So that's one example of other, and there's some very direct like site level affordable housing activities that were done. Um, and then finally, um, what we have done, and I think is a good structure for future investment is kind of attempting to decenter the power, uh, not necessarily have it focus purely on us as an MPO, but to ensure that there are community advocates that are empowered, uh, receive the training and are given some resource to uh, hold us accountable along with other agencies that are operating in our space. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Sabrina to talk about um, how this, um, this sort of evolving approach to equity has informed a transportation measure that we put in front of voters. Uh, ultimately, it did not pass, but um, provides a tremendous amount of context for um, our work going forward. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm Sabrina Owens-Wilson, I use she, her pronouns, and I manage the regional impact team for Metro's DEI program. And our team focuses on strategies to advance racial equity through programs, policies, and investments throughout the region. So I'm gonna talk about um, the racial equity analysis we developed for the transportation measure, um, Get Moving 2020, which was a multi-billion dollar funding measure. Um, while, the, while equity was baked into the process and the, the measure from the beginning um, in a few ways by using um, the equity focus area methodology to help so select the corridors and the projects that were incorporated into the measure, as well as setting stakeholder tables that prioritize um, BIPOC communities and underrepresented communities. 
um, we wanted to run a deeper analysis that would really help us tell the story in a concrete way of how racial equity was being prioritized in the measure to get specific about the benefits for communities of color and to develop community-led equity goals and strategies. And so our analysis for this measure worked um, toward these goals in uh, three parts. We developed a measure-wide analysis we created profiles um, for each of the corridors, and then we had developed a set of equity outcomes and strategies. Next slide, please. Uh, so for the equity analysis um, across the measure, we wanted to understand a few key things. Were communities of color prioritized in the measure and in, in the investments? Were they prioritized across different types of investment instead of kind of concentrated in one type of investment? And then when we're talking about communities of color, who specifically are we talking about benefiting from these investments? Um, so in order to understand how we are pri prioritizing areas of the region where people of color live, we use the um, people of color equity focus area methodology that, that Jeff spoke about. Um, which identifies census tracts in the region with high concentrations of people of color. We focus on uh, specifically the race and ethnicity part of this analysis rather than all three factors um, of, the, of, the, of the model because of our strategic plan uh, for racial equity, um, diversity and inclusion, which calls on us to lead with race. Um, and to develop and make sure that our, our investments have specific outcomes for people, for communities of color. This is not to say that we um, did not look at other intersecting identities or experiences, but rather we were applying a, a targeted universalism approach, which means that we were focused on the specific barriers that people of color face and recognizing that race is one of the key determinants in um, transportation outcomes and disparities. So on the slide, the wheel that you see represents all of the census tracts in the region. And we found that one quarter of the census tracts in the region are people of color equity focus areas um, and that were within the investment area. And so in order to advance racial equity, we defined um, kind of uh, a prioritization of racial equity as investment levels that exceeded this 25% of census tracts. And what we found was that 60% of the total plan project investments would go towards that 25% of census tracts, showing a significant prioritization of investment where people of color live. Next slide, please. For the next question, we looked at specific types of safety and transportation investment and found that across the board, um, these specific types of investment were prioritized also in these areas of the region where people of color live. Next slide. And then the other question we wanted to look at was, so who, who is actually benefiting? Um, and uh, specifically, um, you know, we wanted to disaggregate communities of color. Um, and so while 60% of white residents live within the investment area, 68% of the population of color lived within the same area. And each of those individual populations of color were overrepresented in the investment area. Um, also, so, uh, kind of helping clarify who we're talking about benefiting when we are talking about communities of color. Next slide. So in addition to the um, kind of package level analysis, we created a set of corridor profiles, which dove deeper into the local conditions on the ground, included more information about who lives in the corridor, as well as the data on the issues of mobility, um, housing, affordability and displacement indicators. Um, these were intended to provide an important and detailed context for ongoing measure development and um, implementation um, to really kind of start from a foundation of understanding the barriers that communities were facing so that we could build toward, uh, build strategies that were actually gonna dismantle some of those barriers. And it also helps set expectations um, that Metro would have for our partners and how we wanted to see them approach implementation through a place-based equity-informed strategy. 
Um, next slide. And then the last piece that we um, included in this process was um, we wanted to provide Black, Indigenous, and communities of color an explicit opportunity to tell us what equity and what success would look like for them. Um, we wanted these conversations to also be another um, component of accountability for um, the outcomes of the measure. So we conducted um, a set of targeted community engagement um, sessions with uh, BIPOC community leaders and compiled a list of community recommendations for key racial equity outcomes um, and strategies that would help us get there. We responded to all 40 of the, uh, the community recommendations on racial equity strategies, and in most cases demonstrated how the measure would meet those recommendations. But we were also transparent about the, the recommendations that we weren't gonna be able to meet through this measure. Um, but we're able to kind of carry those forward as bigger picture um, opportunities for the, for the next time. Um, so I'm going to stop there and look forward to um, the discussion and the Q&A, and I will pass it to Joe. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Joe Gordon. I'm a GIS analyst at, at Metro. And uh, here we're going to get a little bit more kind of into the data weeds. We, we kind of started high and then looked at a, sort of a specific project implementation. And now I'll kind of get into sort of the decision making process about, you know, how these thresholds were, were decided upon. And it really was a product for these equity focus areas that were a part of the regional transportation plan, kind of an iterative decision making process that, that involved community based organizations planners and GIS analysts. Um, and it and ended up in, in this this place right here that you see on the on the maps of uh, identifying tracks above the regional rate for three different variables, uh, people of color, limited English proficiency and low income, uh, which was defined as uh, less than two times the poverty level. And then applying uh, a, a, an inclusive Boolean or condition whereby any track that, in, that exceeded any of those rates was included in the final equity focus area output. Um, the last little piece to it was applying a density threshold, a population density threshold to remove some of the largely industrial tracks that were along the uh, Columbia River corridor to the north there. Uh, so that that was kind of the process that that we went through um, the definitely some some pros and cons uh, to it uh, the the pros is that you, you you know you end up with that binary out output and, and Courtney in her previous presentation kind of alluded to that either having kind of a binary or a, a continu continuum uh, to, to your index and the binary makes it kind of easy to compare uh, with, with other GIS layers um, it's, it's simple, it's easy to explain, you know, relative to those regional rates. Uh, so that, that, that works with, with some of the communications and working with, with policymakers. Um, it's also you know, um, stackable for, for lack of a better word and that you can see where multiple thresholds are exceeded and kind of stack those layers on top of each other and, and see these intersections of, of, of multiple uh, communities. Um, and it's inclusive with that Boolean or condition. Um, and, and, and it's also inclusive with the regional rate. It's not some, you know, Z-score standard deviation above the regional rate. And, and so it's not just isolated to the densest clusters. It, it's kind of a little bit more spatially inclusive and, and inclusive in terms, of, in terms of the neighborhoods. Um, the cons are kind of similar and parallel to the pros. Uh, it's a binary output, so there's no nuance. Uh, the difference between EFA and non-EFA is visually and numerically exaggerated by that stark line between you know, EFA and non-EFA, and, and they can be right next to each other. Um, and it's, it's simple, which is you know, good, but it is only three variables. Um, it's fuzzy data, the, the ACS data, the MOEs are not included. So that confounds that issue of where you, you have that boundary of non-EFA and EFA, is it really above or below the threshold? And change over time, when you're looking at these EFAs as they change, it's easy to overemphasize these small changes, like, oh, the track's not a part of it now, or now it is a part of it, and is that meaningful? 
Um, and so th those are some of the cons associated, uh, which is leading to some of our next steps, uh, which is sort of tied to a, a specific project that we're working on right now in partnership with the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization uh, here in the region. Uh, and it's the Social Vulnerability uh, Tool Project, which is aimed at building a regional social vulnerability index, as well as county specific indices that are uh, using local data to augment the more traditionally used, you know, federal, national ACS and census data. Uh, so the, the local data is, is, is trying to fill some of those categorical and spatial gaps that you get with, with some of the census data. Uh, there's a little link here that, that can talk about it. The, the overall process is, is, is similar to, to how, how it's been before with the RTP, continued engagement with the community, continued engagement with government partners, helping to evaluate what, what uh, 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 indicators should be included, as well as helping evaluate the method of actually putting that index together. But this is sort of we're viewing this as kind of our, our opportunity to reevaluate the, the methodological underpinnings of the of the equity focus areas and, and maybe revisit that issue of, of, of maybe not so simple, not so binary and getting it more towards a nuanced and, and continuous uh, index. So, yeah, Joe, Joe sort of, I think, elevates the uh, situation where our analytical tools have their limits and um, I wanted to go back just to say that um, this um, this is an example of kind of using those analytical tools in combination with more direct information from the community in informing our decision making. And I, I think that's been our model and it's it's uh, still adapting. We're still kind of exper in experimentation phase, I believe, on it. Um, but I think we're having a lot of good progress in um, uh, sort of building those relationships with community-based organizations to influence not just our transportation plan, but also our broader investments in um, housing and economic development um, with our partners. And it's been a it's been a, quite a journey, and it's great to learn from all of you on your uh, your efforts as well. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much to all of you folks from Metro. I thought that was also really fascinating and just another example of some of the excellent work that's going on around the country at the regional level. Um, I see that we have about a half an hour for our moderated Q&A. Um, and I noticed that there's a couple um, clarification and follow-up questions for Metro's presentation. If it's all right, I think um, what I can do is forward those questions to the Metro folks, and then we can um, address those after the presentation. I just want to make sure that we have enough time for Anita to uh, provide a fantastic moderated Q&A. So with that, I thought I would take the time to introduce Anita for those who don't know her. She is the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer for King County. In this capacity and in partnership with Dow Constantine, the King County Executive, she leads the county's efforts to be anti-racist and pro-equity in all of its work. She oversees the Office of Equity and Social Justice and works across all of the county's functions to help ensure that King County centers equity racial and social justice in all of its operations, policy, planning, budgeting, community engagement, communications, and more. So just a little bit of a, of a, of a task for her to manage. Um, and prior to that, Anita was uh, the EEO slash Equity and Social Justice Managing Director at King County Metro Transit. Um, and she is also a member of the Washington State Bar Association and has a Master's of Science in Organizational Psychology. And after that mouthful, I think I will just turn it over to Anita. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody. All of that and at bottom line, a servant. Just encapsulated in one word, servant. Um, I have about 25 minutes with y'all. And I, I just wanted to start with a couple of comments, which is, your work today and the presentations have given me breath and life and strength in that I am looking at planning professionals from across this country um, doing integrated work 
which is what we all know is necessary um, to actually change and become the beloved community where everyone can thrive and have power, peace, and prosperity. And I just thank you all. I am, you take my breath away. And so I thank you for that. Um, I, I think that this is what we should do. I, I've been listening and watching the questions. Clearly we need another hour and a half to get through the deeper dive that everybody is looking for. We won't have that. Um, but I'd like to start with um, a broad question that I give an opportunity to each of our panelists to answer and then try to do our best to, to dig down into some of the specific questions that were asked um, by our participants. And before I do that, I just want to take one minute to touch on just a key this and that that each of you shared that just stuck in my mind. Um, for Dr. Ben, for Dr. I mean, Dr. Charles Patton, um, he spoke to the intersections of the very real social dynamics that we all live with um, and under economic safety, historical relations to power. I just want to shine a light on the real of that. Um, Sister Elizabeth Scott um, spoke to um, many things, but she took my thunder around the quote that equity is the optimal um, growth uh, uh, model, um, which is a critical thing. Um, Sister Courtney, um, your comment or a phrase that you used around co-power, that struck me, right? We do sharing power, we do a co-power. Uh, you might need to speak to that for us um, in your time. And then Brother Jeffrey, Sister Sabrina and Joe, a number of things, accountability, decentering power, the use of qualitative data to supplement the statistical, to really make sense of what is going on in the households. Um, you talked about data portraits, which I call personas, right? Um, uh, and, and then Brother Joe, speaking of needing to put things together to build a more nuanced and full picture of what the data is showing. So I just, just a little kernel from each of y'all that you put on the table. Um, with that, my first um, rather broad question um, for our panelists, I believe this is where I would like to start. My question um, is uh, maybe threefold, maybe four, um, but what has been most impactful in this work? Now that is for your organization and your community, or maybe yourself as an individual? What has been most impactful? And also what has been most challenging in your walk down this path? Um, and if you could end with what is one piece of practical advice that you would give others in doing this work? You got it, you got my three elements, most impactful, most challenging practical advice. Again, speak on behalf of your organization, yourself as a human being, your region, whatever you like. And I would, um, uh, let's go backwards. Let's start with Portland and then our sister from uh, Southern Cal and then Chicago. Just a couple minutes, if you would. Please, Jeffrey, um, Joe and Sabrina, your first. Stop. Bring the real folks, tell the truth. <laughs> I'll jump in since I was very last. Um, so most uh, impactful, so I come from very much, you know, being a GIS analyst, I come from very much kind of a quantitative background. And so the, the most impactful uh, quantitative background in a cubicle, right? That's, that's, that's my life, you know? 
And so the most impactful thing for me, especially on this, this, this newer project, the social vulnerability tools project is, is actually the, the community engagement piece with the community advisory group that we've put together. Um, and it, it it, it, it is it is it has just opened me up to this this understanding that that uh, that there needs to be uh, some form of communication from my cubicle to the community right it, it, not just this sort of siloed experience where I'm crunching some numbers and to figure out um, how to not have this be just a temporary um, sort of project spe specific, checking of some box or whatever, but to have it become a, a more systematized approach that this is just how we do our work, you know? Uh, and so, so to me, I, I'm, you know, it, it is cliche, but, but this idea that there isn't really this, this end goal we're going towards that, that this is now just a, a style of doing a, a method of doing work. This is a new relationship that we're trying to form, you know, and, and to, so, so to me, it's, it's just been a rethinking of sort of my role and my work. Uh, the most challenging, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Gary. The most challenging is, is coming from that quantitative background, trying to gently wade into the waters of sort of mixed methods and how to incorporate quantitative approaches. That, that's just overall is something that's still new to me, still challenging to me, and I have a lot of work to do in that regard. Practical advice would be um, just just be honest about the data, and uh, and 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 inspect the data, and 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 be be skeptical of the data, and and look. You know, I, I see so many presentations that never bring up margins of error, and, and that's immediately where my thoughts go. You know, and so so to me, that's the the biggest practical advice, especially for people that are sort of still learning that process. So. Thank you, brother. I'm going to steal the phrase from the cubicle to the community. I'm just stealing it. I got to tell you. Okay, Sister Sabrina and Jeffrey. Um, I will. So uh, practical. I think that, um, you know, we can have plans about doing racial equity work, but really resourcing the ability to apply those plans is key and, and and resources that allow us to do it with the level of rigor that it deserves um, and, um, and giving it the amount of time that it takes to do this work in a meaningful and in a way that engage folks. Um, you know, on the transportation measure, Metro really made sure that we had the resources we needed to do this work um, in a meaningful way. Um, and I think that that's key. Um, I, I think uh, kind of impactful and challenging, um, kind of two sides of one coin. I think, you know, we wanted to be specific about what racial equity meant in this measure. Um, and we wanted to make commitments. <laughs> And that's challenging because, you know, it's a big measure, they're big projects. Um, and uh, sometimes it's, or it's always easier to kind of talk about the idea versus the specifics. And I think going through the process of really being able with community members and, um, you know, uh, defining what it meant, what the expectations, what our commitments were, and then having conversations about what we couldn't do, um, I think um, is, is how we, build coalition and how we get to the outcomes that we want to see. Thank you, sister. Appreciate that. Uh, 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 on the point of resourcing, now is the strategic societal moment, if I might add, that you might utilize to get what you need. Yes. Brother Jeffrey, did you wanna add anything? Sure, just quickly so that others can, but, Thank you. Um, but uh, uh, the, on the issue of resourcing, I think that's also my practical advice, writing in meaningful engagement, writing in um, all the, you know, efforts that it takes to translate data into something that's interpreted and appreciated and, and advanced by all the partners involved is, is something that we don't necessarily do when we approach grants. And so 
you know, just like your communications budget, just like your other budgets that go into this, you need to write this in. Um, impactful, those test applications, when we were able to translate a federal grant into some real results with the community, you know, working on actual business stabilization, working on actual workforce stabilization, and some real advances to affordable housing in tandem with the planning activity, I think that has been amazing and has been also empowering to, to see that um, sort of uh, bring in more folks into the fold in, in understanding and appreciating what sometimes is, seems as an academic exercise. Um, and then the final point is the, the challenge and that, that, that's, being, that's being a white guy with one other white guy as the lead on an equity project and trying to figure out how to um, embrace that discomfort at times and, and, uh, and try to jump in on these issues and, and work directly with the community partners that have a better touch on these communities than I do. Um, and that's been a challenging and I think impactful thing as well. Thank you, Brother Jeffrey. Appreciate that honesty. Sister Courtney, Southern Cal. Yeah, thank you, Anita. Um, so in terms of, I think the most impactful, the thing I'm looking forward to the most for us is getting adopted our early action plan. I need to actually have a firm commitment from our elected body that we can move forward to this work so that it endures because our elected officials, our president's transitioning out. This has been his priority. It's our priority, but we need to make sure again that it continues. So, so for us, it's getting you know that language interwoven in our strategic plan. It's getting that early action plan adopted. So again, um, that that would be most impactful, um, most challenging. I think um, similar to Sabrina, uh, resources. Um, I think um, my agency right now, um, <laughs> I would say is probably a case study in how um, many um, under-resource the efforts, they have grand aims, right? Uh, but they don't actually, you know, consider the FTEs that are needed um, and, and how intense it will be. Um, and so fortunately, we are dedicating more resources next year, but that's something I'd caution everyone, be realistic about what you can accomplish with your staff and recognize it does require that dedicated resources. It's Otherwise, what are you doing? You know, you're doing a real disservice to your commitment, I think. Um, and then the other, I guess, challenge for us would be Prop 209. That's a California unique thing, but it means that we can't um, have preference um, towards race or ethnicity when we award contracts. And that's a little, um, it's a little tough when we want to advance racial equity, right? And we want to focus these uh, these grant programs on it. And now we have to develop sort of, um, you know, uh, adjustments, right? So it's EJ and it's, so anyway, that's an ongoing big challenge for California right now um, for, for, I know Caltrans as well. So that's the challenge. And then the practical advice, one piece I would offer is, I know it's challenging to talk about these topics with elected officials, it is for us. We have some folks in our audience who are very, you know, all lives matter, you know, type of thing. Um, and so I'd recommend surrogates, uh, get people who, you know, are outside your agency that are experts have been doing the work who they, they can, you know, appeal more to your audience, you know, to try to get them to, you know, understand um, their perspective and the realities um, because it's, it's a tough, tough, discussion um, to have with them if they aren't on the same page. Yeah, so that's all I've got. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sister. You see in a lot of um, shaking heads because we all understand the truth of what you're saying and that challenge in California is also one in Washington. So totally feel you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Elizabeth, our sister from Chicago, what can you add, sis? Well, uh, I'll start with impact. Uh, a huge thing for us was adopting the regional plan that had inclusive growth as one of its guiding principles, because by our, our board adopting it and our MPO adopting it, that gave us the permission to really do this work and put resources to it. And what we have been able to do is to change the way that we program some federal funds. We're continuing to push to, to, keep, to keep that work up and going and increasing. Um, and, and we're also now in a, in a place where we can stand up this engagement program and really resource it with the goal of having long-term relationship with uh, community leaders who, can, uh, who we can co-create the future with and really have a more 
um, collaborative, authentic relationship going forward and, and, to, and, to, and to resource this thing at the level that's necessary. So that, that's huge and I'm excited about it. Um, in terms of what's been challenging, you know, it took us a long time to get to the place of the regional plan leading this forward. And when you're doing this equity work, I'm sure everyone, this will resonate with everyone. There are some people, and Courtney just touched on it, there are some people who are kind of coming from behind who maybe aren't with you yet. There are some people who are leading the way, who are like tapping their watches, what's wrong with you, get with the program. Um, and that's sort of the nature of being in the planning space that you have many people that you need to kind of bring along and use your, your coalition and your storytelling power to, to make the case and just keep that movement going. Um, this, this is a practical thing. And then I have one other practical thing is that we found it to be quite useful, kind of to Courtney's point, if your um, advocacy partners are, uh, you know, ready, ready to do the work and you're still bringing some other people along, you know, sometimes bringing some of those people to a meeting to stand up and say, now is the time, let's have the courage of our convictions and start getting these things done. Um, you know, you can have all these different voices in the same space hearing from each other about the challenges and the opportunities that are in front of you. The planner doesn't always have to be the one that makes the case. Um, and, and then just practically speaking, um, you know, this work is hard and it's something that we have to be committed to for the long term. And it's emotional for people and that we have to try to be compassionate to each other and understand that this is a this is a long road and it wears on people and that there are going to be moments where your colleagues don't feel up to showing up for it and there are going to be moments when it's their time to dig in and that we have to have have some yeah have some grace and compassion with the others that we're, we're working towards towards this with hard on the system like deathly hard on the system easy on the people right yeah yeah exactly That's exactly hard on the system easy on the people thank you um dr Patton. thank you anita so i'll touch on the impact first i think what's been impactful as i've been here at psrc over the course of these past two years is being able to illustrate through opportunity mapping who has access to resources and who don't, who doesn't, and how we funneled certain communities into certain parts of our region and they lack that access to resources, and really being able to illustrate for our elected officials the correlation with the race um, and the history that has led us to this space. Uh, I think that's been extremely um, helpful in allowing us to move this work forward. Um, I'll talk about the challenges also. I. I anticipate there will be a incredible challenge that our electeds uh, have said that they're willing to take on related to our equity advisory committee and allowing them to have a voting voice at the table. We're structuring this equity advisory committee in order for us to give them a voting voice, we'll have to restructure or re look at the interlocal agreement um, that currently doesn't allow non-electeds to serve um, and have a voting voice at these tables. But in order for us to get beyond um, a mere space of tokenism or even the optics of tokenism, we really need to think hard and long about how we can reimagine what this can look like for our equity advisory committee moving forward and really give them some power when they're providing these wonderful insights from that lived experience to help shape our policies and plans moving forward. Uh, related to the practical piece, uh, I will say that the goal should be to weave equity into policy. As Courtney uh, mentioned earlier, it's extremely helpful to be able to lean on those policies that we all agreed on when we're trying to be more and more innovative in this space and explore ideas about how we can reduce disparities throughout our region. Um, and I think that's going to be extremely helpful as we move forward in this work and continuing that momentum and continuing to move the needle uh, forward. So um, I think those are my, my three thoughts on that. Thank you, Dr. Patton. Um, before I go to a couple specific questions, I just realized and need to ask Kim Ellis for grace. I have not given her an opportunity to speak her piece. Would you like to add Kim and forgive me? 
No, thank you. Um, I just, I, I, I'll be very brief because I feel like we have a lot of Metro folks here. Um, we were really excited to share the work. I, I think for me personally, it's been very impactful that um, the regional transportation plan, I was the project manager uh, for that update uh, that built off of previous work that we did with our climate smart strategy that has really been a continuum of building community and bringing voices uh, to help uh, shape uh, are the outcomes and define what equity means for our region uh, and also bring along policymakers that haven't uh, always been uh, open uh, to all of what has been uh, presented here. So we really appreciate the opportunity to share and would be happy to follow up with other more detailed questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring forward, we have only about, I'm going to spend about the next five minutes, like five minutes for real, and bringing forth a couple of questions from our audience. Would like you to raise your hand if you would like to jump into the answer and I'll call on you. So I'm also just interject really quick. I think that if there's interest, we can extend the event a little bit by at least 10 minutes if we want. Although I might, hey. Michaela might jump in and say no, but I don't, I think we might <laughs> too. Okay, we'll see where we are. Thank you, Ben. Um, here is a question from one of our participants. Again, let me know if you would like to take this one on. Question is, how have MPOs integrated equity into their grant award programs? And, and, and the second part of that question, um, which I might broaden a bit is, um, has there been any evolution in the selection process or the criteria based on recent current events and national objectives or conversations? Anybody that would like to take that on, uh, spend a minute on that answer? Or oh, somebody jump in there. I can quickly talk about it if that's okay with That'd the group. Be great, Courtney. Thank great. you so much. So, so one of the programs I highlighted our sustainable communities program. It's one of our more significant planning uh, project um, grant grants that we provide. Uh, we we've been undergoing an update of the scoring that we use for it, the methodology that we use, so that we can uh, more heavily weight um, those that those projects that are being submitted that would be implemented within a community of concern, a disadvantaged community area, um, and, and ju environmental justice area. We have multiple types of uh, ways of identifying these communities in California and our region, but basically we do weight scoring so that those, those communities do get more, um, you know, they're more competitive really for our funding pot. And that is a change for us. Um, as many of you know, elected uh, bodies can be um, very, um, challenging to work with they all would like you know their piece of the pie and so um in the past i think we've conflated equity geographic equity with you know say racial equity or true equity um and it's been hard to you know move away from that approach in the past of making sure each county gets its fair share that kind of bit it, it's it's not without um you know its challenges so we have done that it has been um a process and i would say it's um come it's it's been moved more um, and updated just in this past year too to move away yes. from geographic equity more so I should say and um, we're continuing to refine that as I mentioned we're trying to continue to do it and have calls exclusively focused on these communities so that's that's our attempt to do it so that we can just cut that out of a prioritization and instead say this call is exclusively for EJ communities instead so but it's a hard thing with your elected officials so. Yeah, absolutely difficult. Uh, I think that um, Sister Sabrina, somebody, I believe Sabrina spoke to targeted universalism, right? And um, of that, just let us keep in mind, it is about setting wonderful targets for everybody, right? And then taking in account that we are not all in the same place. I have found that very useful. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Next question that I would like somebody to volunteer for is, PSRC just refreshed the Freight Advisory Committee. 
how do the panelists work include freight mobility and industrial lands? For example, disparate health impacts or neighborhood freight and goods distribution or workforce development. Who could take that on for me briefly? Or I can, but my answer is that we're at the beginning. Oh, go for it, Elizabeth. At the beginning, just speak to that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think so. So the Chicago region is the uh, center of freight in North America in terms of things that cross the country. Um, freight is a massive, massive, huge part of our infrastructure and our regional economy, and you know, it's uh, an important economic engine, but at the same time, the land use dimensions of freight, particularly trucks, um, have serious impact on communities. So some things that we've done over the years is work, work, with our, work with our communities to do local truck routing and communities plans. So we specifically, we have uh, industrial corridor specific uh, freight mobility plans that we do, we do with community. And we're realizing that particularly with the growth in transportation and logistics. Uh, you know, with, with the, the pandemic has only accelerated as everybody's getting things delivered to their house. Um, we're going to have to really think about it more at a regional scale and holistically. And so we're kind of working now to concept out um, a regional industrial strategy paired with a regional freight strategy. Uh, and we're at the very, very beginning stages of it, but one of the reasons for the work is that we know we know that the environmental justice dimensions are so critical in this space so that it's not um, some communities that are that are getting the noxious you know land uses and that we we have a system that works that mitigates the health and safety impacts um, on people. So I don't have an answer, but I know it's a very, very important question. I mean, we've we've had we've had we have had so many facilities grow coming up in our region. The industrial vacancy rate is like below two percent. It's like flying off the shelf. So I imagine that we're not alone in that, and it's something that we're going to need to think about how we think about going forward. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jeff, did you want to jump in on that question for us too, please? Just briefly to say that I think this issue is in its infancy in terms of adapting what we have been looking at when it comes to transit development um, and equity and sometimes in roadway development and land use considerations. I, we've taken some look at it with our, something we did recently was the site readiness toolkit. And it was looking at three different cities and developing a roadmap for them to develop their industrial areas. Um, and incorporating some of the analytical stuff as well as recommendations for how to envision developing those sites in a way that's more reflective, reflective of equitable development outcomes. And so I, I think that that has been a starting point. And then the, the march of e-commerce and other aspects of industrial development have huge implications for um, sort of the workforce development activities and, and uh, you know, whether we pursue data centers in a particular location and how much it actually employs anyone um, and the use of that land is, is having some, um, uh, you know, some ripe conversation. But in terms of the, you know, a further mature development on this, I, th I think it's something that is still, we're working on this in this space uh, as planners and, and something that deserves more attention. Thank you, Jeffrey, appreciate. I think I'm gonna put forward, if y'all would give me the grace, um, one additional question um, from our, our participants. And um, it is this, um, maybe uh, it is this, could you please talk about the process or the logic of choosing your equity factors or indicators in your program? Who would like to take that on? Maybe a couple. Is the question clear? Kim? 
I see your hand. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, yes. Um, so for the regional transportation plan, uh, Jeff presented uh, sort of five outcomes uh, around equity uh, that we focused on for our evaluation. Uh, those were really community driven. Uh, we had a transportation equity work group that had planners, but also community members. Uh, and through engagement and work with that equity work group, uh, those were the five areas that were of um, highest priority for our long range plan to address. And then we worked with that work group uh, and Joe um, uh, to really develop the methods uh, by which uh, to evaluate it. And so our methods were a combination of using the equity focus areas, doing GIS analysis, but also using our regional model in ways that we haven't done before to be able to estimate uh, access to jobs, access to community places based on travel time for, for different modes. So it was really community driven uh, and also reinforced more broadly at the regional level through a series of regional leadership forums uh, that we convened uh, that included policymakers, but brought community leaders uh, to sit at the table with those decision makers to provide that direction to our long range plan. Thank you, Kim. Anybody want to jump in, follow up on Kim? That was very helpful. I'll touch on this briefly, Anita. Thank you, Doctor. So um, we're currently working on our equity dashboard, which will inform hopefully a lot of this regional transportation plan work moving forward. And a, a part of that process is making sure that the indicators that we are selecting are being regularly updated. They're from reliable sources um, that they cover the entire region because we would like to create a resource that allows all of our member jurisdictions to drill down into their own backyards and be able to understand the disparities that are happening um, in their own communities. Um, and a part of this will also be us sharing our thoughts on this and being flexible when we take this to our equity advisory committee so they can inform us from their lived experience of, are these the indicators that seem appropriate for us to be thoughtful about and that we need to be considering as we move forward with this work. And also, um, as we're developing the platform, is it user friendly? Because we want them to be able to use it too so they can advocate on their own behalf and for their own communities for this work. Um, so that's something that is um, on the horizon. We're really excited about it and we'll have more for you in the future on that. Thank you so much. I I'm going to take a little executive prerogative right here and just share a, a quick little ditty with you. Um, and then I am going to turn it back over to Dr. Patton um, and Ben, um, or you might want to say something about it or not. Um, have done this work for many, many years. It's been a path, right? You are all on the path right? It's a journey. And journeys are not straight. They got potholes and corners that you turn and stuff you trip over and all of the above. Um, but I thank you for being on the path. Um, I try, I have learned to try to make things to Dr. Patton's point, simple and easy. Um, for folks to carry, regardless of where they are on their own path. And so um, in my close, and I just like to share um, a quick one with you. Um, I say um, to the government that I am a part of, um, if you do these four things, uh, you will be for sure advancing us on this path to pro-equity, to be in pro-equity, anti-racist in everything that we do. And the four things are these, share power, interrupt business as usual, replace it with something better. That is that optimal growth model. Replace it with something better and get comfortable with discomfort. Share power, interrupt business as usual, replace it with something better get comfortable with discomfort. And then my last one, I would say, um, is just lead with love. I will tell you mobility people that I remember a study that basically said that mobility, the ability to move 
can be more important to upward mobility of families than even education. So I just leave that with y'all and I thank y'all and I send strength and love and power and peace and prosperity to you and your agencies and the communities that you are servants of. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Patton. Thank you for letting me be here with you today. Well, I, I, incredible, I, I could say everybody just gives a, a round of applause for me. I thought she did a fantastic job as well as, as our panelists. I thank you all for your time uh, this morning and this afternoon for some of you that are on in central time. We appreciate it. Um, and we look forward to the next peer networking event. If, are there any other closing statements that I'm missing, Ben? No, that sounds pretty great. Um, as always, thank you to our panelists for a fantastic discussion and Anita for moderating such, an, and, uh, such a wonderful Q&A. Unfortunately, we didn't get enough time to answer every question. I think we could have gone another couple hours easily. Uh, with that, I would love to be able to provide contact info for all our panelists to the attendees if you want to follow up with any questions. And um, also just stay tuned, we will be posting the recordings on our website as well as the presentation slides. Um, but lastly, if you just have any thoughts um, or suggestions or feedback for this or future topics, I would love to hear from you. Um, you will get an email from me after this as well. And with all that, thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Much appreciated. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you.